We see undulous extinction, subgreens forming, new greens crystallizing, and during this deformation, the overall effect is that you're getting grain size reduction. And all those processes work together, um, the formation of the dislocations and the propagation through the crystal with all of this um, dissolution, reprecipitation of new grains, um, rotation of grains to um, deform a rock. If the deformation is slow enough and the rock can actually recrystallize and keep up with the deformation, you end up with a texture that is um, much less deformed looking and you get more um, equal grain sizes. Now you can still see a fabric here. There's a, uh, it's, there's a foliation in this rock that's defined by these elongate crystals. Um, and with more strain, that fabric will become stronger with finer grain crystals and a more finely spaced foliation. Here are two examples of, in the, the, left, the left image we see, it's a low temperature um, or a high strain rate to give us this, um, uh, this the bulging and the um, migration of the grain boundaries. Or on the right we see what is a high temperature deformation or a low strain rate where the recrystallization is keeping up with the deformation. And so you see you know, more equant size crystals. And what you're looking at is a fault zone. Here's some mountains there and a fault zone next to the mountains from you know the surface. Here's a tree to indicate this is the surface. And the fault zone propagating down to depth. And there are different processes going on. Um, up at the top of this fault zone, the rocks are cooler and behave brittly and um, deform that way. They break and form cataclasites, um, or perhaps even a pseudotacolite, which is um, a frictional melt that occurs in brittle fault zones. But deeper down, the the rocks are hotter and the deformation is a ductile deformation because of the increased temperatures. And instead of getting um, brittle deformation, it's ductile and that's where we see the development of um, a shear fabric, or which is a planar fabric, or myelinites in the case of um, high strain zones. Now, and this is what the rocks might look like. We start off with um, a cataclasite at near the top of that fault zone, maybe the formation of some pseudotacolite, and then finally myelinites deeper down. If you were to just look at a, a increasing strain in a rock like a granite, we could start off with a rock like like this one, which looks like a typical, you know, in this black and white image, I might say granite diorite because it has some darker minerals in it. Um, but, you know, it looks like a typical plutonic rock. If you deform this rock somewhat, you'll see, I think it's easier to see in the thin section here, uh, grain size reduction. These crystals are much smaller than the above picture. You see some, um, some blasts, some of these relict grains from the original granite that are remaining. If we increase the strain in that granite, we're going to see um, the recrystallization having reduced the grain sizes in the foliation. Even the, the blasts that are left are uh, much smaller than the original, than the less strain. And then ultimately, you're left with a, an ultramyelinite. So ultra meaning it's an, an uber myelinite. So it's even higher strain, it's even more fine grained um, rock because it's undergone even more recrystallization. And we see those where we have very high strain rates. 
and the recrystallization simply can't keep up with the deformation. We can consider rocks on this kind of, in this kind of way. We consider the, the rate of the strain and the rate of the recovery. So that's the crystallization rate. And if you have a very high strain rate and your rocks aren't able to crystallize or recover, that's where you end up with brittle faults and cataclasites of broken rocks. Um, and sometimes producing pseudotacolites. Now, if you're down at higher temperatures and lower strain rates, you might see the rate of recovery um, is more able to keep up with the strain, and so you end up with uh, a sheared rock, so a gneiss or a schist. But if you have somewhere in between, so relatively um, high strain and um, a strong recovery, a strong crystallization, that's where you get um, ductal shearing and the development of, of myelinites. And again, this is what they, they might look like um, if you're looking at a, a, an actual rock from these zones. So um, a cataclasite and this black stuff here is the pseudotacolite. Glass in a rock uh, looks black. Or you might see a foliated nice um, where the rate of recovery is high or um, the myelinites happening at high strain rates and, uh, and uh, a lot of recrystallization. You've seen this diagram before. It's showing you an original grain that might have been rounded and then this non-coaxial shearing, this top to the right shearing taking place and it's taking place because the greatest compressive stress is at some high angle to that grain and it's deforming it and if we kept going we might deform this grain until it was actually stretched out within that foliation parallel to the shear plane. We can have the development, the progressive development of fabrics um, some of which are look like this and this is the development of a crenulation cleavage where originally you have where originally you have a foliation, and foliation is denoted by S for schistosity. Um, and that original foliation uh, would have formed in a planar fashion. But in this rock, that foliation was folded because there was another stress applied to the rock after the development of foliation and so you get um, a, a second foliation forming ultimately if you continue to deform that rock where you have your original the original foliation there preserved in part of the rock but the development of a second foliation um, later on and there's just an, a, another example below um, this is an, the top is the an asymmetric a deformation, whereas the bottom is symmetric. Where we have the S S one preserved there, and then the great a, a new sigma one direction later on, um, compressing the rock in a different orientation, and the development of this second foliation still with the original foliation preserved. And this is what it looks like in a real rock. So you see the S1 foliation folded here, and then the, the new foliation, the S2 foliation formed there. There's S1 preserved and S2 in the new orientation. Um, here's another one. and you know, how many foliations, how many um, different foliation planes can you identify here and how many deformation events um, beat up this rock. It looks like we have an original S1 foliation there and the development of an S2 foliation here. Is there another one? Oops. Actually, if you look closely at this, 
you'll see that even the S2 foliation plane is deformed. So what we started off with was the S1 foliation forming by a greatest compressive stress that's at some high angle to the foliation plane. A second deformation event at a different orientation coming in and deforming that original foliation to develop a new S2 foliation. And then with your um, the original S1 here, the new S2 there, there's a new deformation direction, your sigma 3 at some high angle, sigma 1 at some high angle to that second foliation, and it's actually giving you S3. It's possible to record even more than that in these rocks, but in these examples we'll keep it somewhat simple. Now, while all that deformation is going on, you can also get metamorphic mineral growth. And in this slide, I've got, um, let's call these garnets, these orangish, reddish balls in this rock. And you'll see there's a foliation um, in, in A that is horizontal, and that the, gar the garnet that's grown preserves that foliation. If, let's say the foliation was more complicated, so it had a couple of deformation events, um, the gar a new garnet grows over the top of that, preserves the foliation. We call this um, post-kinematic mineral growth, meaning the deformation took place and then the metamorphic mineral grew, the garnet, and it preserved in its inclusion trails uh, that, that deformation. Now if a mineral grew before deformation, pre-kinematic, you might see a very different looking inclusion trail. So here in this garnet, you'll see that the inclusion trails within it are completely perpendicular to um, what's in the foliation of the rock. Um, again, over here, you see the same kind of thing. Not only that, but in the, on the left-hand slide, you'll notice the foliation wraps around the garnet, and you have these coarse crystals growing in what are called pressure shadows. It's an area where it's protected from the deformation in the rest of the rock. And those form around large crystals um, that were already there. So these are pre-kinematic um, minerals. Or your last final option is a, a metamorphic mineral might be synkinematic, meaning it's, happen it's growing at the same time as deformation is taking place. And in that case, we might see an inclusion trail that indicates rotation during deformation. And that's what we see in these two examples below. And those are fun to see. Um, let's show you some real examples. Here's um, a very good example of what I was just describing in that last slide. You see the foliation here defined by biotites and they're wrapping around the crystal. And it's somewhat coarser in here in this pressure shadows, but look at what the inclusion trail does in the grain. It actually looks continuous in this spiral, this is called a, a snowball garnet. And you have this spiral inclusion trail because the garnet was crystallizing and incorporating uh, minerals from the foliation as it rotated during a non-coaxial deformation. So all of this um, could be recorded in this kind of way. If you consider the metamorphic minerals that might be growing in a rock and different deformation events, you could see multiple generations of minerals growing, so a chlorite 1 and a chlorite 2, that are gr growing at different times relative to the deformation events. We see that we also have two biotites in this case, biotite 1 during the first deformation, biotite 2 during the second deformation. And then um, garnet growing just the most recent deformation. 
All of this can be extracted from the rocks based on the textures that you're seeing, the deformation textures, as well as the relationship of that deformation to the metamorphic minerals that are growing. So there's a lot of information included in uh, rocks, metamorphic rocks, particularly high-grade ones. You can also get a sense, if you collect an oriented sample of rock, you can also look in thin section and know which compass direction, like the orientation of the actual direction within the rock. And we can see, we can get an, a, an idea of the shear sense, so that, that orientation of the deformation in these, uh, what are called mantled porphyroclasts. Um, some that are very common are this sigma clast, where the grain is um, rotating during deformation and it's getting these wings that tell you that it's a, a top to the right deformation sense or shear sense, or a delta clast that also grows wings but they have a different orientation. And mica fish are quite common down here. So a muscovite, a biotite, a chlorite that develops this, I suppose someone thought it looked like a fish at some point, um, that, that um, asymmetric appearance. Here's some real examples of those um, shear sense indicators. This is um, a plagioclase in uh, an, a nice, and you'll see that it's got its wings, and this actually has an opposite shear sense to these arrows up here. That's a top to the left shear sense there. And if you measure this rock in the field with a compass before you collect it, you can say, well, oh, that's top to, um, that could be top to 120 degrees. So you know exactly um, its orientation. Here's a, a delta clast with these fun wings like this. And a mica fish. I suppose. I don't know. Does that look like a fish? Okay, so what you learned in this module was that about new metamorphic mineral growth and replacement reactions, so new metamorphic minerals replacing older minerals, either older metamorphic minerals or from the protolith, um, deformation mechanisms um, and recrystallization um, by crystal defects in this crystal structure and dislocations within crystals. Uh, that you get ductile deformation and high, some high strain that might develop into myelinites and shear zones at depth in the crust, and that you might have multiple deformation and metamorphic events that can overprint one another. And you can also use shear sense indicators like the sigma and delta class and mica fish to actually know the, uh, the orientation of a deformation event in space.